It is my pleasure to introduce, already for the second time, <laughs> Michael John McKean. Michael is the resident, uh, the artist, the resident, the artist in residence of Rubin Observatory, which is a new program that I think many people might not know about, uh, that I'm really excited about. And Michael is a Guggenheim Fellow and a professor of sculpture at the Commonwealth University of Virginia. And um, I'm I'm just very excited about this talk. <laughs> so take it away. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for uh, for coming out. We're just getting organized here, so um, apologize for the for the delay. But um, I'm gonna try to man man every. Ooh, maybe not. Sorry about that. All right, so lots of lots of fumbling, but I'm excited to um, to talk with you today. And so my name is Michael Jones McKean, and I I think probably like a lot of you all wear a lot of different hats. So the the version that that I'm going to be wearing today, the hat that I'll wear today, is um, is as Rubens artist in residence. Um, and it's a position that I'm very grateful to, to have, but one that also I think is, um, we're trying to figure out what it is. So I think um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time if we have it at the end to try to ideate and consider what, um, what the role is, but how, what it could become, but also how it can be helpful. So I wanted to talk just a second about the, the title, uh, leaning into the dark, and it's sort of like a sort of a funny, a funny pun in some ways. But I was thinking back to the early phase when I was doing research on Rubin when it was LSST, and um, not so many years ago. I think as folks uh, here have been involved some some twenty years, but this goes back to about two. 2017, and I was speaking with Steve Kahn. Is this mic working? It's okay? Yeah. You can hear. Okay, great. Um, I was speaking to Steve Kahn, and he, um, we were having this great conversation, and um, that conversation led to another, and it, there was such an ease with speaking with him 
Um, so much so that at one point I just kind of blurted out as like, wow, this is this is really easy to talk with you. And it's kind of surprising um, thinking of a, an artist and a, and a scientist, essentially. Um, and I think like in his really quick New York way, he was sort of like, yeah, that's just because we both don't know what we're looking for. And I was like kind of stunned by this comment and, and maybe even the speed that he was able to, to draw it out. But this idea of, um, of scientists and artists not knowing what they're looking for, it rang very, very true. And, and then a couple um, years later, when LSST became the Vera C. Rubin, I started to uh, do some back study and try to figure out who Vera was and went down a really long wormhole at, at one point. And it's an interesting origin, origin story. Um, I'm sure many folks know about already, but there was this moment where um, Vera C. Rubin was, where Vera Rubin was um, really good at art. And there was a, a, a moment when, when her advisor was um, looking at a path for her and down astronomy and was like, you, there's no path, there's no path there. And so she, they, they encouraged her to go into art. That obviously didn't happen, but at that moment, um, she was reflecting back on this. And she said something that also reminded me of this thing that Steve said was that she was always more interested in questions than in the answers. And again, reading this as an artist, this is this rings so true. Like this is um, this is a kind of operational baseline. The questions are always more interesting <laughs> than the answers. So um, I wanted to start just with with that. But um, you know, I think I've I've organized this talk into three sections, really, and it's there's there are three very quick sections. So one is is some musings on Rubin. Um, some, some ways of thinking about it as an object, some ways of thinking about the folks that have been magnetized to it in different ways. Um, you know, another, another will be um, thinking about what the, what the residency might be. Um, and more is, and another is, um, sorry, a question of how Ruben connects to a larger project that I'm working on, just adding some quick context for that. So there is something kind of counterintuitive that I wanna start with. And the, the idea that we can pull back from a lot of specificity, a lot of granularity that lives inside of uh, Rubin as a, as a scientific instrument. And one of the remarkable things about coming to a conference like this, and also the one in Tucson that, that I was able to go to, is just like how incredibly specific every conversation is, and how the smallest, tiny, um, most granular bit um, becomes fleshed out with such, with such importance. And I think for me, zooming out and trying to consider consider all of the parts as a as a whole feels um feels functional in some in some sense so this is what this is all about in some ways carving out some time to consider it as a as a totality um, so there's um also another way to think about Ruben and th that has to do with thinking of it connected to another set of objects. So not just telescopes or observatories, but thinking in a much more archeological sense or an anthropological sense of objects that humans have somehow come together to, to imagine together and build against many odds somehow within this continuum of aspirational objects, I want to seat, I want to seat an object like Rubin. Um, it's somehow very, very generative. So the other thing about this is that when folks make an object that might be considered, um, there's different language we could use for this, that might be considered visionary. 
Um, there's, a, there's a split that occurs. There's a kind of cleaving off that, that happens where um, on the one side, it, it continues a life as, a, as, its, as its function was predicated upon, as its, in, its life as an instrument. But there's another life that, that splits off and that we don't really know what that will be. There's, um, there's ways that we can imagine it as, um, as something where culture, culture itself becomes, becomes formed. And I wanna talk a little bit more about this as we, as we get going. So there's um, a couple things I should probably do. So I should introduce myself better. And I should talk about what a sculptor is. And it's probably not um, 100% clear. So um, one way to imagine, one, one way to imagine what a sculptor is, is, is someone that is invested in materials, in matter and objecthood and considers them very speculatively. And I, I think if you if you zoom out from from the profession, the discipline of of of, uh, of art, and specifically sculpture, you find a lot of commonalities with other disciplines. So there's um, ways that let's see. So yesterday I was speaking to a couple of people, and. I was in speaking with them, um, we were talking about a session. And what happened was it was revealed, I was acting very confused because I was confused. Um, and it was revealed that the person was also confused, that they didn't know what the session was about. I won't say who it was, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was revealing because what happened was is, is that it revealed the immense specificity of all of Ruben's parts, so much so that people that are working on the same object don't necessarily know what other people are working on on the same object. And that sounds um, maybe simple, like duh kind of thing, but it's also, I think it underscores, um, it underscores something about what Ruben is. So when you have an object that lives on the precipice of possibility, it also collects people that want to work at that precipice. And, but it also creates um, a kind of tension because at that level, at that precipice, there can be um, some level, you're building something that hasn't been built, of course, but there's some kind of tension there. And I'm, I'm interested in that. So I want to I want to talk about something in a roundabout way. So one one way to talk about this object is Ruben is um, is to scaffold out a set of ideas that live around it, and I, I think it's a helpful I think it's a helpful method. So there's um, one one version that if we were to chart back um, fairly recently is that artists artists and scientists. Now, when we think about a group of scientists, a group of engineers that don't really know what each other necessarily is working on in a specific way. There was a moment not too recently, um, not too far away, when artists and artists and a scientist were absorbed in the same body. They were the same person. Um, that, that that person might have been involved in understanding things about the sky. They might have understood what the sky might for, foretell in terms of its seasons and its rhythms. They might also be in charge of ceremony. They might also be in charge of um, rites in different ways. So they were in the same body. And it's not until recently that that cleaved off into some very specialized set of, set of knowledge sets. So 
There's another, there's another um, way to imagine this too, and just trying to find commonalities. It has something to do with um, why we might be here. And we, we can imagine that different ways. You might look inside yourself and you might answer it in a very precise way that has to do with your discipline. There might be another way, and this, I don't wanna count everyone in this, but if we zoom back far enough, we see that, we see that we're here because of a, a group of materials that have been gathered together, assembled with immense amount of care immense amount of precision um, at a certain place. And it's, I think we can lose sight of that very easily, but trying to imagine that, that object where it lives, it's, um, its state of being as a thing on the planet can, I think can be interesting as well. So the so the Reuben when we when we say Reuben, we're also just talking about a container, like it's a kind of catch-all for this immensely complex networked system that's made of tons and tons of parts. And when we think of the parts, we can also think about touches. We can think about all of the ways that that a human touched something. And when we think about really special objects on the planet, there are groups that countless touches occurred. Um, and I, I, I say this maybe in an overly romantic way, but an object that magnetizes billions of touches, millions of decisions, it collects a kind of residue, a kind of residue of a kind of energy. Um, and there's a way to understand it, I, uh, I think, if through a different set of lenses, and one lens one might use is a lens of sculpture, um, another lens might be empathy. So there's a couple objects in Ruben that I think are, are maybe interesting to consider. Um, you know, one, one that I've spent trying some time trying to figure out from a distance is, um, the M1, M3 mirror. Are there folks that have worked on this, have, that have worked on M1, M3 in different ways? Nobody. I'll, I can tell you a little bit about it. Well, oh, you visited the mirror lab. It, yeah, it's a sanctuary. It's a kind of, a, yeah, it's the kind of um, temple um, for, this, for this object. So the, you know, the M1, M3, it, it, Already it dictates um, something uh, stylistically because it's um, it's two, it's not just one mirror, it's two mirrors. So it's like, it talks about these parts in this very um, interesting way. But so if you think of this, if you think of the origin story of this, of this object, it's, it's a kind of mythic, mythic story. One that if you were to rearrange the language slightly, like you could tell it in the tradition of Homer or something. It's like, it's like Argus and the Argonauts. Um, so it's 52,000 pounds of glass that, that's been melted in a, in a kind of kiln chamber that's spun to sort of create a kind of parabola. Um, ground down for years and years, literally years, um, to reach a kind of level of perfection where someone actually grades it perfect. Someone, we at a certain moment after years, someone says it's perfect. And so when you think of this object over this amount of space that has like very little variance, even like a, a fraction of a hair's width over its, over its entire diameter, it's, um, it's, a special, it's a special kind of thing. But it also has a different life too, because then it moves from a place like the mirror lab and then it travels, it travels in the world. It moves, it moves from Arizona, it moves down the Pacific, it goes to some, it goes to a mountain, it moves up to the top. There's another surrogate mirror that's built. It's a version that's almost identical um, 
in certain respects to the to the M1 M3 because of its value. Um, nothing can happen to this mirror. If anything happens to this mirror, the whole project disintegrates. So there's like this crazy fragility that lives inside of the object that I think is um, it's it's worth noting, um, not as not to strike fear, but just to think of a its specialness as um, as a container of of human touch. So a couple a couple other things, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot. Um, here's some here's some pics that I like. So this, so when you go to the mirror lab or you, you look at the mirror itself, it lives also on the shoulders of other dreams and other innovations and uh, other, other fever dreams. And of course, one is, um, one might be someone like Galileo and, and thinking of Venetian glass and thinking of alchemy and thinking of stolen, stolen trade secrets and thinking of hand polishing something you know, thinking of a kiln, thinking of the ways in which humans have have um, have organized fire into a tool, thinking of thinking of metallurgy, thinking of transmutation of materials. This is an obsidian mirror. So these um, a mirror as a kind of mystic object. This particular mirror, the M1 M3, is um, one that supersedes. Um, the one that one that surpasses, um, one that surpasses us. So another another scaffold, and you know what? I I also usually when I start, I always say like, you should interrupt me if you have questions. Um, so if you, if it, it's hard to see y'all, but if you just shout out, I can, um, I can also ask, answer, try to answer questions or, or deal with. Um, Break the ice. I have a question. And oh, also I can please. that I can bring you the microphone to ask the question. Uh, it's like a couple of things that went in this direction, something like it's an object that so many people take an enormous amount of care to build. Right? Yes. And, and you talk about the perfection of the mirror, et cetera. And it sounded like very much like the way a sculpture would build a sculpture. <laughs> and so, where is the boundary between an object? How, where, where is the boundary between an object that is not a sculpture and an object that is a sculpture? I imagine that some sculpture have functionality, obviously. That yeah, that's, that's right. So, you're, you're saying sculpture. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, I think one of the things that if we if we think about it from um, just from a historical perspective, one of the things that we do is we um, we we divide things up and we organize things um, to help us think about them, but also to help make them because our, our culture has become so specific um, technologically so but but you're totally right if we zoom out just a little. There's an object like the mirror. I mean, we could consider it a ceremonial object. We could consider it a spiritual object. We can think it think it of as a quasi-religious object. We can think of it as a sculpture. Um, so there's another. I mean, there's a there's a slight version. You know, like if you think of um, a thought experiment, for instance. So if you think of the mirror, like part of you know this the mirror travels gets down to Chile. The same at the same time. And someone tell me if I've got this wrong, but the research that I have says that someplace in Germany is grading the silver that's gonna go on the mirror. So that silver gets packaged up, it goes to it goes to Chile, it reaches the summit. Folks in Chile, they they take it out, they put it in this massive chamber and they coat the mirror. In some ways, it's a kind of um, a set of processes that we that just can unfold um, logistically without any kind of meaning attached to it. There's another version that, that says 
is in the thought in the thought experiment was that we um, we gathered together and we asked we asked folks that were that were connected to the project to if they wanted to 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 give over a small bit of silver something that maybe was something special something connected to a history something connected familially and we used that silver to go we sent it to germany it got graded and then it's they sent it back to us and then when the silver goes on the mirror it's changed it's fundamentally changed as a as a meaning thing as a thing in the world because when the when light photons from the outer reaches of the cosmos make contact with this silver membrane it's not just a logistical surface it's a it's a it's a it's a humanized surface and that's what a sculpture might do that's kind of what a what another in another in another culture in another time we would imagine that this object differently, another ritualized purpose. So it's very close to doing it already. I mean, it is, it is doing it. It's a, it's um, a very uh, delicate thing, but thank you for your question. I'm gonna talk about this cave real quick. So, cause it, it also talks about um, what's going on uh, at the summits, both in Tololo and Panchong. So, there's um, this cave that, that I'm thinking about and I've done some research on. There's um, inside the cave, there was discovered all of these lithics. So lithics is a kind of a term that archeologists use when they find a stone that's been um, used, that's been manipulated to make it look like a tool. It's like a tool. And so they started looking at this at this cave and what they discovered was something wild because they, they learned that there was this a Neanderthal um, community for, for thousands of years that had used this cave and it was littered with all of these lithics. And on the floor, the lithics were used up. So they, they used it, they sharpened it, they used it again, they sharpened it. These aren't the ones exactly. I'm just showing you what lithics look like, but they were just little nubs. Years later, they discovered another another compartment in this in this cave, another another secret chamber, and they looked at it, and the, the lithics were different. They were all from all over the place. They were very very sharp. Um, what you could find though with both is that you could track where they where they came from. So they looked at the Neanderthal tools. And they all pretty much came from one source that was like a day's walk away. It was pretty easy to get to. Thousands of years of going to this one source to get, to get stone to make tools. They looked at this other, this other cave. What they realized, it was, it was human. So modern human, early modern human. What they realized was that all of these stones were pretty much brand new. That they would use them once and then discard them. And that they were stones from up to 150 miles away. So they would continue to keep looking and looking and looking for the best, the best stone. And it was a kind of a pathology in a way. And this is, um, I think, an interesting, something interesting to, to sort of hold in the memory when we think about the kinds of objects that we're making, the kinds of decisions that we're making. Um, and how certain origin stories maybe live in this live in a cave like this. Yeah, this is a. <laughs> it's pretty. When you think again, like when you think about this, this is um. There's a kind of there's a kind of um, mythic quality of of this of this whole process. This is actually not the mirror. This is the coding chamber, but it's it's still an impressive, um, impressive. This is the mirror. This is it going up the mountain. This is the chamber itself. We'll just look at a minute. This is such a sci-fi video that, that you all have produced. 
this is the M, this is the M2 um, that's getting coded. And this is the M2. So I just wanna say one more thing and then I'm gonna pivot. Um, there's, a way, there's a way of thinking that what's happening at the summit and all of the people involved in its production, all of the people that will be involved in producing science, um, there's a way of thinking of, of um, this as a straight line, that the object is produced, the object is, is made, science is created, um, and it's a kind of, um, there's something beautiful there. There's, um, and this, this maybe relates to um, something we've spoken about already. There's a way though that what happens with that science as it travels into the world is that it changes a kind of a kind of cosmic vision for people. And this is culture. This is when when we think about folklore and we think about the ways in which um, these stories tell us things, this is a kind of very really an important function of a Rubin, not just the science, but the way that the science travels into the world to become culture. And I, um, as an artist, when I think of this machine and when I think of a group of people that are connected to it, um, this aspect feels incredibly, um, incredibly important. So that, leaves us to this, and I'm gonna go through this really fast. So I've been working on this project for, um, since 2017, it's called 12 Earths. And Ruben is connected to, um, to 12 Earths, it's one site. So the form of 12 Earths is, is a, a simple ring, a simple path that travels around the planet that connects 12 locations. So if one were to begin walking, you would travel around the earth and you would end up exactly where you, you, retur you would return where you, where you began. So this, this process took years to figure out because there's a million different ways that you can travel around the earth. <laughs> and um, you know, with that, there's billions and billions of, of computational um, of permutations for how each ring lays, it, lays itself out, but also all the sites that could potentially be lay on the ring. So this took a while. So I did lots of research into many different objects, but there was a few that really became special. So here's just a few. This is just um, a kind of teaser. Um, this is the uninhabited zone. This is in the South Pacific. It's the, the location that's the furthest away from human humans. Also the place that we crash land, most of our derelict satellites. So it's also called Spacecraft Cemetery. This is the Bawieza forest on straddles uh, Poland and Belarus. It's a primeval forest. The Grassberg mine in West Papua the largest precious metals mine on the planet. Also a symbol of uh, imperialism. There's a, a new pod of whales, um, blue whale that was discovered off, off the coast of New Zealand. Sem Semipalatinsk, this is the site of former Soviet Union's um, nuclear testing. Helen Island, this is a, an island in Palau near, near where I was born that is um, slowly sinking into the, into the Pacific. This is an archeological site in, Pol in Portugal where a four-year-old child was discovered um, 30,000 years ago. Oops. 
the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, sort of like a, a line that draws in between the Atlantic Ocean, the largest mountain range on the planet, a peek into Earth's subconscious. So the artist in residency is, um, is something that we're just trying to figure out. I don't expect you to read this. This is, I just put these up here as, um, as kind of notes, um, but it felt like a way to um, open up a discussion, maybe about Ruben, some of the ideas about Ruben, thinking of it um, in a more speculative way, but also what, um, what this role might be, um, how it could be helpful and um, There's um, the last, this is the last image. There's a, a website for 12ers that, that I'm slowly working on. And I, I just posted some, um, some kind of new story about, uh, about Ruben. But slowly it will, slowly as I learn more about Ruben and your all's research, I hope this, this story deepens. And so over time it will become more, um, more elaborate. Okay, thanks so much for listening. I'm uh, happy to. <laughs> I uh, I was realizing as I was talking. I don't know. You all were at dinner last night. I was shouting. I was just just a, below the level of shouting to communicate. And my voice is so, is so messed up. So I apologize if it's um, if it feels bad. But um, yes. Yes. Oh, go for it. Yes. Uh, is there a question at the back? Yeah, but go for it. Yeah, you got the mic. Yeah. So uh, thank you very very much, Michael. I'm 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 um, I'm very happy that Ruben uh, is doing the artist in residence program because I think it's an um, amazing uh, way to interact uh, and uh, I know I mean there, I, I don't know whether you're aware of an uh, initiative in Europe there are a lot of initiatives about art and science we can talk about that later on yeah. and 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 ESO already hosted a few of these artists in residence which is really nice and uh, and CERN as well but CERN yeah so but uh, so I think that that's great I want to ask you another question because you are a sculptor and uh, I know that, as you said, like touching and and this uh, this um, sort of uh, interaction is um, super. At least what my friends who are sculpture told me, like you have to always touch the the the, the sculpture. Yeah. It's kind of very important uh, uh, interaction with it with with it. And and I, and and since we are we are not touching our object. Yeah. That's that's that's, a, that's something, but. But I mean, what what we are doing? I mean, we are collecting photos. Mm. <laughs> yes, yeah. and photos are my favorite particles, and the, they are always they are touching our mirrors, you know. And and since you are so much impressed with these mirrors, and I just wonder whether you were considering this uh, dimension of photons interaction with the mirrors. The the know? photo interaction. The photons. Is that what the light. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you, I, I mean, thank you. Thank you for your question. And you said a few things that resonate with me. And, you know, one is this idea of um, touch, right? And, you know, I think um, in, some, in some very psychedelic way, if you think of Ruben, it's, its only job is to create contact or, or with light. And, yeah, yes, yes. So if you think if you think of it, so so we walk, I was I was talking to Robert last night about this. So if we walk outside into the sun, we're getting hit mostly by sun sun's photons. But at any moment, you know, we walk out, we're also getting hit by stray photons coming at us from the cosmos. And it's just this machine that is designed to capture some and articulate them, but it's just about touching, you know, this photon touching a surface and that surface reflecting into a camera lens 
my camera holding it, but it's a series of really delicate, precise touches. So when I think of it in relation to sculpture, it's so it's such a beautiful metaphor. It's so it's so much about about touch. But yes, the when I think of the, I mean the other side to the question is is the the photographs, and so thinking of thinking of this as a as an elaborate camera, you know, in relation to a history of art is also, I think, exciting to, to think about. Um, but there's the other side too of thinking of the archive. So the archive, the library is, is another important part when we think of the observatory as a kind of culture machine. So this, this idea of it building this massive library, um, I think is very beautiful. I mean, there's something so, so gorgeous about it. Um, I think I touched a little bit, but there's more. Yeah, I'd love to talk more. Hi, I'm I'm Steve Ritz. We spoke at, yeah. uh, at hey, in Tucson, so good yeah. to see you again. Um, and I'm really glad you're here. Um, and I think there's a lot we're going to learn from each other, which is great. Um, I just wanted to react a bit to your statement about the humanizing of the mirrors of us. I I I would suggest the mirror is already human in yeah. the sense that engineering is a deeply human thing. Yeah. Uh, mathematics is deeply human. Um, every line of code that people write, every document people write, every single thing that you might consider technical involves individuals, their own creativity, their own spark, they're all the sum of their experience. That's right. And, and it's, I think, very important to see every aspect of this observatory as precise as it needs to be and looks. That in itself yeah. is, is human. Yep. So it doesn't need to be humanized because it already is, but connecting with yeah. people beyond yep. our very fortunate group of people who get to work on this, yeah. I think is critical. And, and I hope that um, this interaction over time will, will help with that as well. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for your comment. And I, um, I completely agree. And it's the, uh, I mean, part of, part of the, the awe when, uh, so I, I haven't been to the summit since the pandemic. Um, but the first time that I went, I mean, part of the awe is, is thinking of exactly what you just relayed, is that this is a human object, that humans decided to make this against all odds. And it's, there's, a, there's many odds. So it's, um, that's that feeling of, of awe that wells up inside of you when you start to puzzle together all of these aspects that collectively have to be networked together in the most precise way to work. I mean, you're totally right. The, the question, the question, I think um, the next question, and this is maybe not concerning a lot of people, but is communicability. And it's, this is the power of metaphor, the power of poetry, the ways in which that something that does that within itself is so awe-inspiring. How to articulate that awe to someone else, I feel is, um, it's, it's the other challenge. And I think hopefully we can work on that together. Yeah. We have two questions on Slack, which I'm gonna read on behalf of the people that asked them. The first one is from Sara Bonito, um, who was on, who's one of our co-organizers who asked, who thanks you, and asked, do you think this artistic view can help enhancing inclusivity in astronomy? Ah, uh, wow. Thanks for your question. Um, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, um, I mean, one of, um, there's a few ways that I'm thinking of to answer this, but when I think of my discipline, um, so much of so much of the discipline of art um, baked into it is is exploring our own subjectivity, our own our own identity, um, and there's a way that that can meaningfully, I think, create space. 
So I am, um, it's a, the question itself, I feel, I feel needs more time to, to really unfurl. It's, but this is um, important. I think it's an important opportunity too. I may propose that both science and art tend to be historically non-inclusive, but perhaps the synergy can be more inclusive that yeah. it's part. Yeah. We have another question on staff. We have previously had a, uh, from George Beckett. We previously had an artist in residence program in Europe, which I think is the same one that Dragana alluded to. One of the things that the program achieved was to challenge those of us involved in the associated science as to our understanding of what we are doing and why. Is this something that may come from the Rubian residency? What were, yeah. Okay, if I'm understanding the question, thanks for your question. If I'm understanding it correctly, there's, um, there can be a vacillation and I'm sure this happens all the time. And it, even from a systems perspective, there's a vacillation between um, the parts and the whole zooming in between the, the minutia of something and zooming out to the totality of something. Um, if you zoom out just a little bit more, you encounter, you encounter why, um, you encounter meaning, like not just well, why, but you encounter what something begins to mean. And I think that's, um, I don't wanna prescribe, but it's a question that, um, that sometimes I think artists wallow in, yep. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, but it's a, it's, it's also feels like a great opportunity to imagine a set of exercises for, for how one might to begin imagine, imagining what, what the work means, what all this means in a deeper sense. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna let this session run for another 10 minutes since yes. we started late, just so you all know. And lunch is right here, so we're gonna go. Thanks, um, so I find it really interesting the choice of uh, places for the 12 us, because I think if we were to do it like as scientists, we would go, we made it go through, you know, like California, Europe, where bits of the observatory were built. But I think it's very interesting that you actually chose like natural places. Like it puts a bit of perspective, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your question or your comment. Um, yeah, it's important. I mean, I think when you're, if, if, if one thinks about 12 Earths as a kind of portrait, so a kind of a kind of portrait of 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 the planet in relation to in relation to us there's each each site is a kind of story each each site is a kind of um a way that one might begin to understand some aspect of of the of earth so it has to the diversity the expression of diversity um felt super important in some sense 12 locations isn't enough um it could be 10,000 Earths, you know, but uh, but there's a way that 12 felt felt right for other reasons, but yeah. In fact, there is an astronomy program called, I think, 10,000 Earths. Oh, yeah? It's about exoplanets. Yeah. The, exo the exoplanet project. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There are twins of the Earth. I have a question actually about the 12 Earths. You presented them in a specific order, which wasn't the order along which they lie on the path. And so... I mean, is there any any meaning that you find in the way in which they lie on a path on Earth? Or are you gonna scramble them in a way that is meaningful for another reason? Or was it just a random order in which you chose to present them to us? So the, the way that you encounter each site as if you would be moving on the planet? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, um, it's I, I can't control control that part <laughs> as, as locations fall. Understood. But it's it's a it's something that I am thinking about for sure because in some ways the it's a navigation system too. So built into the project is a way to understand how to get from one site to the other, and so there's some communication system there. So it's one part of the project that we're, we're we've been working on for a while. But but literally like you know thinking of a forest connected to a meteorite crater, connected to a, an archeological site, connected to 
an underwater mountain. I can't control that. <laughs> um, uh, I Oh, thanks. It's so fascinating. I wanted to explore a little bit about what you just said about the number 12. So what, why 12? And is there any relevance, do you think, of 12 for Reuben in particular? Or have you thought about that? At all? So why, why, the, why 12? Yeah, so it's a great, it's a great question. Oh, I'm not allowed to say that. Thank you for your question. Um, Thank you for remembering. I'm such a bad person. I, I know I, I, have a, I say this. Um, it's um, 12 is baked into so many aspects from a mythological sense, from a folkloric sense, um, from a, a sort of shared spiritual, spirituality on the planet. 12 is a kind of... Um, an interesting, um, has interesting histories. From a numero numerological perspective, 12 or mathematical, like 12 is, a, is also interesting. I think um, in, in music, we 12 is an important number. 12 like appears again and again. So it felt like trying to connect the project to a pre-existing set of histories felt interesting to me. Um, but then there's also there's also my own logistics, you know, of working on a, working on a project for 12 years. Um, what could I do? What what felt reasonable? And on the one side, it could be 10,000 Earths. I don't know how I could do that project to really fall into each to each place and to really try to understand something there. Um, I also think it needed enough sites for there to be complexity. There needed to be a kind of diversity in that expression. So it couldn't be five Earths, you know? It felt like 12, 12 um, hit on a number of, checked a number of boxes off. I hope that helps a little. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, uh, hi, I, I'm, I'm Luis and I'm doing a, a piece in Poland and I found very interesting that you named the, the forest the, that, uh, that is in Belarus, it's like the border actually between uh, Belarus and, and Poland, I just wanted to comment on that and it's very, I think it's very interesting one and I actually want to ask like what was maybe the motivation of it and if you want to also know some more context about it. I uh, yeah, I know people from the, that live very near to that forest, so I can also <laughs> help you with some stories and say and say the question one more time. Yes. So why did you choose the the forest? Oh, why did I choose the forest? Do you, so you know this forest? I haven't been there, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. It it's um. Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. This this forest is really special. I don't know if if folks know about it. Um. So Balawe says um. It's a primeval forest. So what that means is that it hasn't been it hasn't been touched. So it's it's the forest as if it it's the forest that we would encounter ten thousand years ago, right after the ice age. Um, so there's something there's something a way that time occupies lives inside of this this space that's very special. Um, the other side is, you know, in thinking of and thinking of this project, there's other kinds of intelligence that I wanna that I wanna talk about. So when you think of Ruben, and I'm thinking of Steve's comment, um, there's the expression the expression of human human intelligence inside of an object, human ingenuity that's built up on the shoulders of thousands of other projects, thousands of other discoveries. It's there's such a beautiful containment there, but if you think of this forest and the sentience that exists there, it's non-human, but it's beautiful. And trying to understand that that expression there, I think, is um, important. So from mycelium networks to the trees themselves, this whole kind of organism as a as a meta intelligence feels really, I think, in fun to think about that's that's why i chose it so yeah. we're gonna close soon i i'm hearing the voices of people at lunch so it probably will get pretty loud here in a second but i do want to ask you one last question when you flash the charge 
to the artist in residence or the, I don't know, the, um, the declaration, the definition of the role. I, I caught one word, which is care for or take care of the telescope. Yeah. So should we think of him as one of the caretakers of this telescope maybe? On oh, the yeah. Yeah. I mean, totally. I mean, I think we all do it. And I mean, I would imagine we, are, we all are invested in it in a different way. Um, you know, some, some are, might be a custodian of an idea. Some might be the custodian or the steward of, um, of something physical, like the maintenance of, of something, the maintaining of something, the rebooting of something. But yeah, the idea of care, and it's, it's a word that I, I didn't bring up, but I think is so operative in, in imagining another layer of meaning in, in Ruben. Yeah, care, that's great. Thank you. Let's close on that note and let's yeah. thank Michael. Thank again. you, everybody.